We are so excited to bring you today's guest. Brett Larkin is an incredible yoga teacher. She dives into so many different aspects that really light me up and align with exactly the things that we love talking about here from chakras to kundalini energy. She was like, can we speak in Sanskrit? Is that okay? I'm like, girl, just, just do your little thing and it will be so fun. So the reason why we wanted to bring Brett on today is because you know here on The Elevated Life for the last 12 years, we've been practicing yoga. This has been something that that seemed kind of fringe and outside the box and something that wasn't very normal over a decade ago, but now it's becoming at the forefront. You see yoga pants and every Lululemon ad, and it's just so much more than the postures. And I think Brett's going to bring a beautiful wisdom and um, just appreciation for the practice. So thank you so much for being here today, babe. I'm so excited to talk to the two of you. Let's go deep. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. So I know that our journey leading up to how we got into yoga came from CrossFit competitor, got hurt, needed to stretch, needed to go inward. We were on this very weird trajectory. So I'm curious, take us back to how did you first hear about yoga? How'd you get started? And did you fall in love immediately or was there resistance to the practice? <laughs> mm, I love this question. Well, I grew up dancing. So I was always a really hardcore dancer. And then it was suggested to me in college uh, this guy I kind of had a crush on. He was like, you know, you really love dance and Pilates. You have a lot of anxiety. Like you should start meditating. So I started meditating with him, not even because I wanted to, but just because I like wanted to get out of the friend zone. And then he said, well, you should try yoga. And I literally looked at him and I was like, why would I do that? Yoga's for wimps. That, that, that verbatim, those were the words out of my mouth. Because as a dancer, like I was just like, that's just all like feelings and stretches and I had zero interest. But again, uh, because I wanted to impress them. I was like, okay, I'll go to a yoga class, but only if it's the most intense kind. So that's how I found myself uh, in the second row of a Bikram yoga studio, which is hot yoga. For those of you who don't know, competing with the people in front of me in the front row, trying to get my leg higher than them. Uh, and I did that for about six or eight months. And I actually talk about this in the book because I have high pitta, which is the fire element. And so we, it's like, like attracts like. So it made sense that I was attracted to that style of yoga initially, but when we look at a big picture, that style of yoga is actually terrible for me if my goal is to come into balance. So that's how my yoga journey started. I would go to these hot yoga classes. I would then be completely depleted on the couch for the rest of the day. But even the hot yoga was like burning off this layer of anxiety that I didn't know I had. And then I did some online videos and I was like, okay, I don't think I'll make a fool of myself if I go to you know like a, a regular yoga studio. And that's when the love story really began. I started like going to every studio in Manhattan and I realized that this was a practice that could really help with my anxiety. I had so much anxiety, like my pre-yoga life. I can't even remember that well because it was just me in a very panicked state at all times. I love that so much because when we started yoga, we were CrossFit competitors, as I mentioned. And so we had heard that Ashtanga yoga was the CrossFit of yoga. So of we course, were, that's where you went. Yes. Let's go. Let's go hard as we can. And I remember being in competitor athlete shape, but doing 15 minutes of yoga thinking, I can't fucking do this shit anymore. <laughs> this is like so much on my mental capacity. I can't handle it. I'm like in downward dog talking to myself. I heard this is when I knew I had to extend my yoga practice instead of resisting it. I heard I can't be doing this shit anymore. And I'm learning my intuition. I'm learning my relationship to my inner world. And I just gently ask what shit, all this yoga shit I need. I've got things to do. I need to be doing the laundry. I need started to just list things. And I'm like, hold on, girl. I don't even do the laundry. So we're going to stay here for 30 minutes. So that was when I started to increase my practice. And then that led to rocket yoga, kundalini yoga, just experimenting and dabbling. Like you said, once you like, it's like getting a tattoo. Once you get one, you're like, let's, what else can we do? Like, how else can we add to this? So for us, we also did the same studying all the old teachers back in the day, grabbing old textbooks, reading stuff from Yogananda, really trying to get back to how far to the original information can we get to? So it's interesting how that journey, how you mentioned, it starts with like competing, want to like have my leg the highest, but then it turns into this practice of like going inward and no longer competing in the external world, but finding that relationship with yourself. So when did that shift? Like, when did you say, okay, I've been doing this a while, obviously flexible is that's like check one of eight things, you know, we got that things start to evolve. When did you shift to like, I love this so much. I want to teach people. How did that transition happen for you? 
Thursday night, I'm in my teacher's class. I've shoehorned myself into pigeon pose, which for anyone who doesn't know, it's like this very deep hip opening stretch. I'm literally have my forehead on the floor. I'm trying to, you know, like get into it even more. And the teacher comes over to me and I think what she's going to do is like praise me. So I'm like, oh, she's going to tell me I look really good. And instead, what she said to me is she said, notice if you've pushed yourself too far in this pose. If you push yourself too far in this pose, it's likely you push yourself too far in life as well. And that was like this light bulb moment for me. Sounds like kind of similar to what you had, where in my book, I define yoga is awareness, right? It was like, that was the moment this voice was, I I got awareness of this voice that was living rent-free in my head that was telling me, you need to do better. You need to push. You need to do the best. Um, And I realized like what, I had a different choice. Literally her saying that, I was like, wait, I have a choice. Like I could compassionately back out of this posture to the point of not extreme pain and spend some time there. And so once I realized that yoga was gifting me a choice to how I responded to life, I was addicted. I was like, I need to do this. I must, uh, you know, study this at the most advanced levels, which is of course how I ended up in teacher training. I secretly knew I wanted to teach, but I would never have admitted that to you at the time. I felt way too scared to embrace that as my identity. I thought if I taught yoga, I'd be poor. I had like every imposter syndrome, money block, like you name it. Like I had all of them. And so I did, you know, all these advanced teacher trainings, but I was definitely in denial about my purpose and too afraid to actually share it with other people. You know, it, it, you know like Britt mentioned, it, it's so important if if someone hasn't done yoga before there's so many nuances to it. Not only are there multiple yogas, like different, completely different styles, stuff very hard on the physical body, some stuff's very hard on the spiritual body. It may uh, face, like force you to look at the, the some of the demons that you have trapped inside of you. It's so interesting how it's like the longer that you do it, the more you find out, not about yoga, but the more you find out about yourself. It's like the most incredible system for really discovering sort of who you are and where you've been held back. Like you mentioned, we live in a culture that, that praises how good we can be at things. Perfection is the standard that we're all sort of looking for. And in yoga, the person who can do the splits or put their legs behind their head or do any kind of crazy stuff is not necessarily the person doing the most yoga. Like that is just like, it's one portion of it. How much can we be with ourselves? How much can we be aware of the awareness? It's it's so it's so deep. Can you talk a little bit about the difference since you do Kundalini and, and teach that, can you talk about the difference And what that uh, a class of kundalini would look like versus someone going to a typical like flow or some sort of power yoga or anything like that. Because for me, when we did kundalini, I was like, what the hell have I just stepped into? I remember doing a chakra series with Maya Fienes and was like, if Chris walked in right now, I would literally be embarrassed. And he's seen every side and whole of me. And that was the one time where I was like, this is kind of weird. So can you explain what is kundalini yoga and how can people get started when it seems a little, although it's not hard, it's intimidating. Can you talk on that? Yeah, it is intimidating. So I like to describe like Hatha and Vinyasa yoga as working primarily with the physical body and working with the eight limb system. So what that means is that traditionally the asana limb of the eight limbs is, believe it or not, like preparing the body to be able to sit in meditation. So when we look at something like Hatha and Vinyasa yoga, it's like, okay, let's do sun salutations, let's stretch, let's strengthen, let's do all these things really just so we can have an erect posture and sit for long periods of time in meditation. And it's a system that works. Like my son's kindergarten teacher uses this same system. She has the kids come into the class. They all do the wiggles. They do like jumping jacks. And then she's like, okay, let's sit and do our work. So the yogis, like they figure that out too, right? It's like, we're going to move the body in order so we can be still. And then we have all the other limbs, the breath work, the, the focus, the absorption like all the other pieces. Kundalini yoga kind of said like, screw that. (laughs) We are going to do a practice that's primarily like we're moving the physical body, but it's designed to affect the energy body. So while Hatha and Vinyasa yoga is primarily concerned with like the meat suit, and of course we're moving energy through the chakras and the meridians and all these things, like it's more a preparatory phase phase for meditation. While Kundalini is like, we're just going to do everything at once. We're going to like chant mantra. We're going to meditate like between poses, you know, find mini meditations between poses. And we're going to do more like rhythmic percussive movements with lots and lots of breath work. 
um, in order to stimulate energy in the body and potentially work with like more of the organs. Like you'll, you'll find Kundalini sets that are like for the liver or for anger or for the adrenals. So it's a more energetic approach as opposed to a physical approach. And the point of Kundalini yoga is to have an opportunity to observe how you react to stress. That's how I think of Kundalini yoga. It's like stepping into a mad science laboratory or where, I mean, one of the marquee phrases for Kundalini yoga is poke, provoke, and elevate. Meaning that anyone listening to this, if you go into a Kundalini class, you need to be aware that like, that's what you've signed up for. So if you feel poked and provoked and irritated and potentially a little like triggered, that's the Kriya or the science of the yoga doing its work on you. It's showing you how you react to stress. And like, do we have this a little bit in Hatha Vinyasa? Like if I'm holding a chair pose, right? Like my my body's under stress. And and again, it's such a misconception with yoga because so many people think like yoga is just to help you relax. But yoga is actually also about strengthening the sympathetic nervous system, not just getting into parasympathetic, like helping us better handle stress. And like Kundalini yoga is like taking that as the focal point. I'm going to pause there because I could talk about this forever. But um, is that helpful in terms of like, just helping people think about how these two lineages and styles are different. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful explanation of although in physical yoga and, and flow you're dealing with your energy is connected to the body. You can't help, but uh, manipulate it. But with the Kundalini, I think you've really explained how you're actually going in on purpose to aggravate the stuck energy that's within those channels. Yeah, I'll tell you, whenever a friend asks me, hey, can you share some, some yoga with me? Can you share a video or a YouTube or something? I almost, especially if it's a guy, I almost always send them Kundalini. And it's interesting because they almost never write me immediately back. And, and then I'll talk to them like a month later and they'll be like, dude, I, it, it'll always, the, the conversation will come and be like, oh my God, I forgot to tell you about that video you sent me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What'd you, did you do it? Like, what'd you think? They're like, I cried. <laughs> I'm a full grown man. I I cry. I, I I don't know why I cried, but I tapped into something that was so deep inside of me as I was doing things. And so many people get memories. What I find a lot of times is that, you know, the, the whole idea that, that, that we store stress, we store uh, anger, so it's so much stuff in our in our body. And that when we tap into that, when we breathe into it, when we move into it, a lot of times that stuff just spontaneously comes up. It's it's really impressive what being in a yoga class can do and the amount of people that I've seen weep is, I mean, it, it, it's it's amazing because finally we're refinding the tools that people discovered forever ago and starting to use them. Like how potent this is in our modern day lifestyle. It's so important for people to do yoga. Like if I, if I go back and give myself advice when I was 20 or 16 or something like that, dude, get into yoga immediately. Like start doing these kinds of things because how you'll feel about yourself. When you understand how you react to things, you can start to, to watch the movie sort of play out before you get into it. You're like, okay, I know I know today's going to be stressful. I know that when I'm in that stress, I'm gonna be needing to do these things. And so there's so much more you can anticipate. You can do the same thing watching your partner, not necessarily during yoga, but just during life. You're like, okay, I know how I react. And I know that this day's gonna be, I know how they react. And then you can start to bring some of those things so much into life. That's why yoga is, yoga is a practice for life. That's why I, I, love, I love the title of your book. I mean, because it's so important to start bringing those kind of aspects into our own regular life outside of the mat. Can you talk a little bit about how you're able to balance those two or how you're able to, to bring the really good parts about uh, yoga and, and use them in your everyday, like day-to-day -day activities? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, yoga just, when yoga came West, so much of it kind of got lost and twisted. It just kind of got integrated with the Jane Fonda movement that was happening in the 1970s and 80s. It evolved into a group fitness class. But I have a whole chapter in my book on the history of yoga that really explains the origins of this practice and how it wasn't meant to be taught as like a one size fits all movement. It was always meant to be personalized. It was always meant to be handed down by like one teacher to one student or in the Mysore style, which is where a lot of the more modern yoga originated in India, like the Mysore style is we might be practicing in a group, but the teacher would only give like Brit new poses when she was ready and should only give Chris new poses when he was ready. And he might tweak them based on what he saw Chris like struggling with as an individual. So even though we're practicing together, it's like, we'd all be practicing together in silence while a teacher appropriately added on things. And like, if you just compare and contrast that to like how we practice today, which is insane. It's like everyone's supposed to be on the same breath cadence, moving at the same time, like a synchronized swimming routine. Like 
it, it doesn't make any sense. And then don't even get me started on like women, we're cycling, we're not, too, we're not the same, any, you know, 28 days of our cycle, we need different practices to support us. Um, so one size fits all yoga is a myth. Um, yoga being just asana is a myth. I think we've all been really circling around this idea. Like yoga is awareness. Yoga is the science of energy management. That's why it's so popular right now because we're living in the information age. We're inundated with way too much information. We need tools to better manage our energy. And it's like, wow, we, we have this science on, on how to do that. And then the real yoga is off the mat, exactly like you just said. So uh, I called the book Yoga Life uh, because paradigm shift that I'm trying to invite people to step into is instead of thinking of yoga as this thing you do or this place you go to just view your entire life as a yoga studio, like all your interactions, all your conversations to be bringing that lens and layer of awareness into how you're moving through life. Because actually like practicing on the mat and doing yoga on the mat is quite easy. We're in a controlled environment. So for me to keep my breathing steady or to think certain thoughts or th certain mantra, like it's a controlled environment. All of a sudden you put me in a car and someone just cut me off in traffic and I'm late. It's going to be much harder for me to kind of, uh, control or weave my thoughts towards the positive and regulate my breathing. So everything we're doing on the mat is actually like the easy yoga. The advanced yoga has nothing to do with advanced postures or back bends or all the things we see on Instagram, but it's actually like how, how connected and aware of my habitual reactions and patterns can I be in a conversation with my spouse where emotions are escalating? And my book gives like over a dozen little yoga habits of how I like sprinkle yoga throughout the day. I also hone in on three key principles from the yoga sutras. Um, I kind of like, like thrown the yoga sutras out a little bit in terms of just like, if you want to be a householder and practice yoga, because I think so much of the sutras is actually designed um, for like the elderly yogi who would go meditate in a cave. Like if we want like a more like yogic text that's for like what I call the householder, meaning like someone with kids and a job and responsibilities. I think the Bhagavad Gita is like a much better text to look at, but there are three core principles from the yoga sutras that I absolutely love. So I'm happy to touch on those as well. Um, if you guys want to go there. Yep. Yes. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so yeah, so to, to like look a little bit about where yoga came from, um, back in the day, what would happen is, so I'm talking like thousands of years ago, um, the traditionally yoga was practiced by either young, young men who are entering the equivalent of priesthood, meaning they were going to go be like a Brahman and perform rites and rituals, uh, as their life path, meaning they kind of like the equivalent of becoming a monk. Like they weren't going to marry, they were going to live in an ashram their whole life. They have lots of time to practice all eight limbs. Like yoga was for that group of people. And elderly, elderly men. So basically once a grandfather was done being an advisor in his town, he would start preparing for the next life because the yogis believed in reincarnation or in that time, that was the belief system. So he would leave, he would renounce all his possessions, say goodbye to his friends and family and go live and meditate in a cave and practice yoga literally as a way to detach from his physical body. So originally like the body was seen as an obstacle to overcome. <laughs> Um, yoga was about transcending the body, leaving the body. The body has all these pesky urges. It wants food. It wants sex, right? So that's what the manual of the yoga sutras is actually written for. It's like how to transcend the body. It wasn't until, you know, just, let's see, I guess 130 years ago now that Krishna Macharya repositioned yoga as being for health and well-being and being good for the body. That's a totally like more modern take on yoga. So where are we going with this? So the point is with the yoga sutras, we, we have this yoga that's been passed down that's very much about transcending the physical body and designed for these two groups of people, the young priest boys and the, the elderly folks who are preparing for reincarnation to like leave their physical form. What about the people who are householders, that middle stage who have clutter in their garage, who have kids, who get like 50 emails from their kid's school a day while also managing their job, you know, all of those types of people. And there actually is one sutra in the yoga sutras uh, it's Sutra 2.1, so it's right at the beginning of the second book, that defines what yoga in action is, meaning yoga for people who are like taking action in the world as opposed to yoga for people who are just meditating or doing this as like their full-time job. And then the sutra gives us three principles. 
So it says yoga in action is, and then we have three words, svadhyaya, which is, it's often translated as self-study um, or self-awareness, or often it's translated as like reading scripture. I like to really think of svadhyaya as like the self-awareness that leads to self-care. Because if I'm living in the real world and I need to show up for my kids and my partner, like what's the point of self-awareness if I don't use it to nourish myself so I can show up for other people in a positive way? The second word is tapas. Tapas is kind of like what we were nerding out on at the beginning of the call. Tapas often gets translated to heat. I don't love that trans uh, like that translation. Um, like so, people might describe it as like the the burning friction that you feel when you're holding that chair pose, right? Or you're doing that kundalini pose and the arms are up. So I like to think of it as like your the burning desire to evolve. It's like that alchemy, that transformation. It's like the wood getting eaten by the flames. It's that alchemy, right? It's doing something different. So the cheat phrase that I like to use for tapas is like cultivating the opposite, going against your habitual patterns. So if my habitual pattern is, you know, to always be late, to like challenge myself to show up 10 minutes early, that will be very painful for me to do. <laughs> and that's actually an act of tapas, right? Do the same as like the discomfort in a chair pose, because it's like doing something in a new way. And then the last word in that sutra is Ishibari Pranidhana, that often gets translated to mean God. It gets translated as surrender. I like to translate it and use the cheap phrase relinquishing control, relinquishing control. So like relinquishing control of all the things that I can't control anyway. Um, so those are the three principles that I really hone in on. I have a whole course just about these three principles. It's like 40 hours because that's how much I love them. But that's what I think about when I try to live yoga off the mat. I'm like, how can I have uh, enough self-awareness in order to self-care? Because if, if I'm depleted, like nothing's going to go well. How can I work to go against my ingrained default behaviors, which might mean like making a smoothie instead of eating Nutella straight out of the jar or, you know, something much deeper. Like we talked about, uh, you know, how can I be less, less micromanaging my husband, for example, or trust him more. And that's kind of tying into the third one, right? Like Ishvari Pranidhana. How can I relinquish control of all the things that I can't control anyway? Because again, yogis just realize like it's a huge waste of prana and energy to try to control things that you can't control. And what can we control? Really not much. Like Ourself. our breath. <laughs> our breath. How we our choose breath. to move our body. Mm -hmm. uh, like what we choose to put in our mouth. Like, mm -hmm. it, And that's really it. Like there's really not a lot. So that's why they got really focused on those things. I really love that this conversation has led to the idea of yoga being practiced off the mat, the book, yoga life, the elevated life. It's all essentially saying the same thing is, you know, and taking it back to the Sanskrit word yoga itself, meaning yoke or union, that connection with that higher spirit that within your own self. And I think that you're right. It's easy to find peace in, in the postures, but trying to find peace in the line, in a checkout line or customer service call, that's really when you're implementing an integrating the work that we're practicing on the mat. So many people, when we teach meditation, oh my God, I suck at that. I'm terrible at that. Yes, you are. And that's why we call it a practice because we're not great at the first one. So the question that's come across um, as you were sharing is where do you struggle when it comes to your yoga or your meditation practice? Where is that that resistance that you are surrendering to at this point in your practice? Because you're obviously years in and loads of study. So where do you find yourself maybe challenged or, or struggling a little bit now? Mm, that's a great question. Cause I feel really good these days. I was just thinking about this. I'm like, ah, I feel like I'm in a, you know, like such a good spot finally, because it has not been the case. I mean, I had to do the yoga overhaul on myself personally. Then I had to do it in my transition to motherhood and losing my dad. Um, and then I had to rehaul my whole marriage, which kind of like was at a low point <laughs> during COVID. So I've really like, this is why I love sharing about these tools so much because like I've seen the skills, those three skills that I just outlined, like I've put them to work in a variety of situations. I think, you know, the, the part, if I had to say what I'm struggling with, it's like this interesting human phenomenon that all of us will always resist what's good for us. Like there's still a part of me that's like, you don't need to practice today. Yeah. You know, it's like the angel and the devil on the shoulder, right? And, and just really recognizing like that's never going to go away. That's normal. Like the body kind of wants to take the path of least resistance. And there's almost this like childlike quality that each of us have of, 
Cause it's so crazy because we love yoga. You guys love yoga. And like, I'm sure you'd tell me too, like, does that mean it's really easy to always make it to our mat? Yeah, like, definitely not. <laughs> no. And it's like, but it's so crazy, right? Cause it's like, why does the brain resist mm -hmm. what we know is is, is good for us. Like, I know that it's better if I read in bed and have a really slow, tranquil evening rather than like watching reality trash on Netflix. But like somehow that's still like, there's still a push pull there. But the, the, what's so beautiful is I feel like where I'm at at this moment, it's like, I have so much awareness, right? I have so much awareness. And, and that's what I really want for everyone is like, when you have awareness, you have all these choices. Um, but the resistance to get on the mat is, is real. And this is why I think creating a personalized practice or like having the tools. And I love that you guys like combine and have such a plethora of like different modalities that you're offering people because you need a big toolkit. Cause it's like maybe one day, like I can't get on the map, but I have the tool of yoga nidra or the tool of like listening to a guided like hypnotherapy or like something like all these things that you're, you're also offering. Um, so it's important to just have a diverse toolkit to help like meet you where you're at when you're in those moments of resistance and just having like a sense of humor about the resistance, not taking it seriously. Yeah. I think that's such a great piece of advice because, you know, even 12 years in, I still find myself in that inner voice. Like I'm good. I've mastered it. We don't need that today. Like, mm, but you kind of do need to keep the ongoing maintenance up sis. So you're, I, I love that you're open and vulnerable about sharing that there really is like, even when you love it, even when you know it so deeply, um, there is still that resistance of sometimes not wanting to get on the mat. And I think that len lends and leads to the conversation of knowing what you need, knowing where your energy levels are, because maybe you're right. You don't have a 45 minute, one hour practice in, in your uh, capacity or in your energetic cup today, but you do have the capacity to shift and say, you know, what? I have five minutes of deep breathing and, or I could take a 10 minute walk. And I think that we, you know, talking about perfectionism, I find that so many people get stuck there is if they miss that one hour of yoga every day that they plan to do for five days in a row, then they just completely fall off the bandwagon. They're like, well, I fucked it up. I'm not good enough. I've just, guess I'm not going to do this anymore. So I think having this conversation and knowing that the struggle is real is important to share that also flexibility and the choice is available that you can say, you know what, maybe today I am not in the mood to do one hour freaking hot yoga, but I am in the mood to just lay here yoga nidra style and just relax and receive because I need more feminine quality in my life. Mm -hmm. So I think I think this is really an important piece of our conversation today because so many people don't give themselves permission to just pivot or change or allow for something else. They think that they have to have this perfect one hour a day to do list. And if I don't get my like self care done by 7am, then you know, forget it. When you talk about being able to integrate throughout the day, how you bring yoga and union throughout that, um, uh, throughout the day. So can you talk about maybe one or two practices that you do throughout your day? If you, let's say you miss your yoga in the morning, I don't know about you, but we're, we're morning yoga people. And also here's our other secret at 9 PM when our phones like go off to like no more social media, wrap it up. We do a little yin yoga and we watch love is blind at the same time. So we get balance of both worlds so we can watch our things and we can also relax and stretch the body. So what are some of those tools that you use throughout the day that help keep you in unity? Mm, it's such a great question. You know, the breath is like the one thing that, that is portable, right? So we can focus on it at any time. So, I mean, the, vibrator, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the, the breathing is just so, so powerful. So mm -hmm. I often try to notice like just noticing the breath. And I, and I talk about this in the breath chapter in the book too. And, and this blows my mind. So I just want to share it with everyone, like any attempt to just notice your breath, so even if you just pause, like everyone listening to this, just pause right now and ask yourself, am I breathing through my nose or mouth? Do I feel the breath more in my belly or my chest? Does the air coming into my nostrils feel hot or cold? So just pausing to observe the breath automatically shifts your nervous system without any effort to change it. Isn't that crazy? And I talk about this book. I'm like, there is nothing else in life like that is like this. Like me thinking about the laundry in my laundry room right now does not get it folded. Me thinking about money in my bank account does not make it grow. But just simply thinking about how I'm breathing has this insanely potent effect on the nervous system, even if I do nothing else, right? So 
I would really encourage people to think about how they're breathing and putting their hands on their body throughout the day. So that's something I do all the time is I put one hand on my heart, one hand on my belly. Why I love this is because it forces me to notice how I'm breathing. It also forces me to ask the pivotal svadhyaya questions that we talked about. How do I feel? What do I want? How do I feel? What do I want? Most of the time when we're suffering or things aren't going well, it's just because we're depleted. Like we've stopped parenting ourselves. And so just that act of like hands on body, noticing how I'm breathing, like sometimes how do I feel? What do I want? It's like, I'm hungry. Like, oops, I've been working for like four hours. I forgot to break for lunch. Or Mm -hmm. it could be something much deeper, right? Like I'm yearning for some intimacy with my husband or, you know, I really just feel like I need to be outside. Like I haven't gotten any fresh air today. And when people struggle with this, it's like they'll ask that question and they won't get an immediate response. And that's because we like this part of us that's in touch with our desires has been numbed. Like literally society in our school system like numbs this part of us. So if you don't get an immediate answer, just know that that's normal and you just have to be patient and wait. So a lot of times I won't get an, an immediate answer and then it's like, okay, let's check Instagram. They're like, no. I'm like, girl, you were sitting here until we get an answer. Like, I don't care how long it takes. And sometimes like the answer might just be like, I need to go to the bathroom. Like I need to pee. <laughs> and like, but at least I'm, I'm tuning in and I'm honoring what I find. So like those little practices, I think also really letting go of perfectionism, which I love that you, you brought that up. So sometimes let's say I skipped my practice because I loved that example, or like it didn't happen for whatever reason. Like, I'm just going to slip it in, even if it's fugly. So like, here's an example. I might just whip out my yoga mat on my bathroom floor. And like, we have to go take the kids somewhere. My husband's shaving and we're talking about weekend plans. And I might just do like a couple quick cat cow while I talk to him. Now, is that as good as like a deep introspective practice? No, but at least I'm getting some essential spinal movement in. I know as a Kundalini yoga, that's like cerebral spinal fluid. That's going to help. Like, So I just kind of let go of the practice needing to look a certain way or needing to be perfect. Um, I just posted something on Instagram yesterday where like I skipped, I couldn't get my morning practice in, don't know why. So I did this like somatic, like fun kind of undulation movements while doing my makeup routine. I was just like, we're just going to fuse this together. Like yoga routine and somatic yoga routine or like the makeup routine is now like everything's intermished. So there's such an opportunity to have like creativity when you just write yourself a permission slip that it doesn't have to look like a scene from Eat, Pray, Love. You don't have to be at an eco retreat in Bali. Like you don't have to have, like I've had some of my most powerful, and I, I want to share this with people because I've had some of my most powerful, spiritual, like heart bursting open, like Kundalini flowing awakened moments, wearing dirty pajamas, like practicing not at 5 a.m. You just don't know you know, when this practice is going to blast your heart open. And it's not like there has to be all these prerequisites. Many teachers told me there there are prerequisites. You have to wear white. You have to do it at 5 a.m. You have to open with this mantra. And again, I, I love if you can do that and you want to do that, do that. There's beauty in that. But you're not uh, disqualified if your practice looks more piecemeal or if you're highly adapting your practice to meet you, like that's what my book's about. It's like, how do you create the perfect practice to meet you in the imperfect moment that you're in? That is advanced yoga. That is the skill of yogic adaptability that nobody's talking about or teaching. It's not, you know, handstand or even like the 75 minute meditation. No, it's, you know, it's amazing how you can constantly, when you want to, You can sprinkle so many things in your daily life. You don't realize how many little bitty moments we have where we're waiting. We're waiting at a red light. We're we're waiting on a friend. We're waiting at dinner. It's just, there's always these like little bitty moments. And rather than picking up the phone, like you said, it's so much easier if you'll just turn in for a moment. And a lot of times, like you said, turning in is one of those deals where you want to ask yourself something. You want to ask that question and do not be glued to the answer. I think the question that you brought up rings so deep and so true and is probably one of the most important questions that anyone can ask themselves on a daily basis. In fact, every yoga session that we start off at our goddess retreats and even our evolved couples retreat, getting the men and the women on the same page together, we ask that question, what do I need? What do I need? Because no one's taking responsibility to fill their cup. They're looking outside themselves and hoping that they'll get it from their partner or their Instagram posts or this or that. When all we have to do to take radical responsibility of filling our own cup, nurturing, self-parenting like you talk about, 
taking care of our inner child starts with that question, what do I need right now? Because what I needed yesterday versus what I needed today were radically different. And I think it's so important for us to have a list of those things that light you up and bring you joy. It's actually one of the modules I teach in, inside Shine School, my self-love program, on how to create those self-care rituals because it's not about did I do that one hour yoga practice perfectly every day? It's did I show up for myself and do consistent work or disciplined work? That's what the 5 a.m. and the white and all of that is about building discipline so that you have a consistent routine. So I think asking that question, what do I need today? What do I need right now? And giving yourself permission to actually open up, hear yourself, and then give it to yourself. It's a two-step process. It's not just about asking, but it's also about following through and taking the action. So I think that question alone, like, cool, get on your mat. But more importantly, ask yourself, what the hell do you need, sis? Like, that's the most important question. I love that you brought that up. Yeah, it's yeah. something we can layer onto that too. Just if yeah. you want to take, like, if we want to keep questioning, it's something else you can ask yourself. And again, this is in the book and there's like a little quiz and everything, but you can also ask yourself, like, do I need more earth, air, or fire in this moment? So that's another thing I ask myself all the time. Like when I'm sitting down to meditate or sitting down for my time on the mat, you can just use that little frame. And we don't need to deep dive into Ayurveda. I have like, again, some highlights just at the beginning of the book, but knowing, like I talked, I started this conversation, like owning up to my Pitta dominance. So I know that like a that's, lot of times <laughs> when I'm coming to the mat, if what I'm trying to seek is to balance and nourish myself, uh, that it's going to be air and earth that I'm going to need more of rather than fire. So that means like my practice looks like a lot of grounding, a lot of poses close to the ground. For someone with a different dominant dosha, their personal practice would look a little bit different. So that's why the book starts with like a quiz to just kind of help you figure out your dominant dosha and then reverse engineer your yoga practice to support you. Because if we look at the etymology of that word dosha, like dosha literally means that which can cause problems. It means fault line. So that means whatever dominant element is within you is the one that's most likely to skew out of balance. It's the one that tends to make decisions for you uh, because like attracts like, and that's how you end up with the Pitta people at hot yoga, the Vata people at Kundalini yoga, right? When, when really often what we need is to like cultivate the opposite and that's the tapas, right? Cultivating the opposite. Like for me, doing restorative yoga is like extreme tapas because I would much rather do 108 sun salutations, but that's not where my true work is. That's not where my spiritual development is. So this is a very sophisticated lens that like you don't have to do 200 hours of yoga teacher training with me for. You can like literally just read the book or like get a couple core concepts and then really be able to tailor your routine to your energy levels throughout the, throughout the month or the year or even the day. Yeah. And if you're a Kappa like me, you go to both classes and you're like, I don't know, I want it all. <laughs> I, I, I love where this is going and talking about how different people need different things because it, I mean, it is, it is so silly true. I mean, it, it, and so many people just think, I'll just copy whatever you're doing. And I'm like, please, please do not copy what I do. Like, let me just show you some of the things. And if the, if you latch onto this, this is something that, that feels good for you, hundred percent, please do it. What would you say for a person who's not done yoga? Who like this is not foreign because at this point we all kind of know what yoga is in in the like Instagram way. How does a person start? Where, where should they go? Should they be going to a class? Should they do something at home? Do they need an expensive mat? Like if I were starting out base, I don't have anything and I've never been anywhere. What is the best way to get me to start sort of start on the journey so that I can find my own way? Mm, don't buy an expensive mat. Nay, um, my, all my favorite mats are like the twelve dollar like mats. Cause I just stash them all around the house. So I literally have just one in every room of the house. So don't buy an expensive mat. Um, you know, give yourself a lot of grace and use this as a time to, you know, explore your inner dialogue, right? Like, so just know that the poses are like a vehicle for you to have more self-awareness and that the poses are supposed to feel good and should fit you, not you shoehorning yourself into a pose. I would definitely recommend like figuring out your dominant dosha. This does not have to be complicated. Like grab a copy of Yoga Life, just like do the little quiz at the beginning. And then the, the book walks you through creating a personal practice. So it literally says like, this is what you'd pick or like what I'd suggest you pick as like a couple poses to do if you're Pitta dominant, if you're Kapha dominant, this, these are the different elements, right? So it's very, very self-guided. I think using that lens of like, what is my dominant dosha? Like, I wish I had known that as my first experience. It would have saved me so much pain and so much torture. 
So I would say, figure out what your dominant element is and then start just experimenting with poses that you know and breathing techniques that you think can bring you into balance. Um, I would put a lot of pressure, like take the pressure off yourself. I would do YouTube videos. I have a ton. There's a great content out there. I'm sure you guys have great content. Like just find someone who you can study with at home. And I think starting at home is great, honestly, because you're not intimidated. You have the privacy. You can pause. I always tell my students like, pause me. <laughs> and also you don't need to do what I'm saying. Like you can use me in a video to like get started. Cause I do this too. Sometimes I'm just like, I need a lot of times I do my own videos. I'm like, I just need someone to like, get me started. But then I'm like, eh, she's doing pigeon. Like, I don't want to do that. I want to be doing this other stuff. Like, right. And so like, you don't need to finish the video. Like no one's watching you and giving you a grade. And it's not like you have to start what you finished in the exact way following along with whoever's teaching. And I'm sure you guys would agree the same for like people in your community. Like if you want, like stop the video as soon as it's not serving you anymore and start doing your own thing. Like maybe you want to stay like 10 minutes longer on pigeon on the right side, as opposed to the left, because you have really bad sciatica or something's bothering you on that side of the body. That's the beauty of the home practice. So just really adopting this idea of like being your own body detective and figuring out what feels good for you. And I, I, I really like the home practice too, because you're able to move at your own pace. Like I think most group classes move too fast and for beginners, like they just can't follow along with the breath cadence and then they end up feeling bad about themselves or they're just like, so in their head, trying to follow along with the movement that they're not able to breathe and they're not able to get kind of that awareness state, which is the goal of yoga because they're just so in their intellectual mind, kind of like trying to follow along to complex choreography. Yeah, I agree. And we, I think we can both agree that the breath is the most important part of the yoga practice. And so if you're not breathing, if you're not connecting to your breathing, you're cutting it off short because you're trying to catch up. I remember when we started our home practice together, our breath pattern was different, but I wanted it to be in sync and I wanted to be together. And for the first year or so, I would alter my breath to follow along with his and then at some point in my practice, I was like, bro, that's like, not me. Like we're different sizes. We're different everything. Like, so there was a, there was a moment in my home practice where I was like, thank you for being here. And it's cute when we sync up and our arms, like, hit, you know, at the same moment, but it doesn't have to be that way. The synchronized swimming. So I think, yes, a home practice is so important so that you can go at your own pace, but I even think that the home practice requires more discipline than showing up to a yoga studio because we put our money into the yoga studio and we feel there's accountability because we've got to show up. There's a time, there's a class, there's people. But for me, I find that if I set that time with myself and I don't have the financial investment or the societal pressures, it's my choice to want to show up on the mat. And when I show up every day in my home practice, well, I try to do every day in my home practice, I feel even more mm, disciplined or proud of myself for staying committed than if I would have just paid a bunch of money and felt obligated to go. Mm, yes. Great point. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about yoga that I learned in my training was that our age is reflected by the flexibility of our spine. And you talked earlier about the importance of getting that energy moving along the spinal column, letting the brain communicate with the body. And I know that you do a chakra challenge. So can you talk a little bit about energy movement, the chakra system and why that became important to you? Because it is the foundation of how I teach at all of my goddess retreats. And even my coaching practice is built to go through each one of the seven main centers so that you can find wherever you're stuck along your journey in evolution. So can you talk about how, I mean, obviously you can't get into yoga without coming across chakras, but I don't know. Did it fucking light you up? Like it, I was like turned on. I'm like, is this why I've always loved rainbows? Like, what is the deal? Like, can you talk a little bit about the chakra system? Yes, definitely. And your goddess retreat sounds so fun. I would love to come to one one day. Yeah. The chakras, I like to think of them as just like your iPhone has programs on it. Like my iPhone has a calendar program, an email program, a timer program where I can time things. It's like, we have these programs that exist within us at the level of each chakra. So there's a relationship program that kind of fires in my heart center that anytime I'm in relationship, it's sort of telling me like what to do and how to act. It's like a pre-written script. But the issue is like a lot of what we've learned and a lot of how we've been programmed is from either society or our parents, or it's not necessarily conscious, right? So we have seven energy chakra, uh, seven chakras that run from the base of the spine to the crown of our head. Each of them are kind of governing or running a different aspect 
of like our throat chakra would be like our communication program where our first chakra would be like our safety program. Uh, so that's kind of like how I like to describe it to people. And then it's a little bit like Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs. Like if I don't feel safe, well, like this is an interconnected system. So everything else is going to get a little bit wonky, right? So, and then like the sixth chakra, which would be like this bird's eye view, right? This breadth, this, uh, you know, eagle view perspective, as opposed to being like the ant and the grass, um, that's a very different texture or frequency than like muladhara, the root, for example. So it's helping us get familiar with all these different aspects of ourselves. And it's ultimately showing us like why we do the things we do. I think that's why I fell in love with them. I was like, oh, you know, I have this excess energy at my heart chakra that's getting me like overly attached or overly controlling to, to people while other people might be more shut down in this area. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a beautiful system. It has so many avenues in. You can connect with the sounds, you can connect with the colors. Um, I mean, it's just incredible to think about the fact that we have this psycho-emotional information at different core parts in our body that actually also correspond to physical uh, places within us as well. Yeah, I was I was just thinking like when you have dis-ease, it's an emotional imbalance in one of those energetic centers. And one thing that I found extremely fascinating in my study of the chakras is that they are developed from, uh, it takes about two years to develop each center. So in the hypnosis work, Chris has taught me that your um, critical factor, basically your ego is developed at around age 11 or 12. That's when your belief system is set in stone. And then you get to kind of move forward with what you've gained through the parents you've chosen the environment, all of that. What I found recently fascinating is that the chakra system is also built on that two year cycle between each chakra. So from six months to two and a half years, you're developing your root chakra. So if you had a tumultuous childhood, you moved around a lot, your parents separated, there wasn't a good family connection, then what you talked about, how we're pre-programmed essentially, we're pre-programmed from this childhood experience. And then every two years you move up each chakra. And so that allows us to get to about age 12, which is why I can see the correlation between your hypnosis work. And it's how I got, it's how we kind of cross paths. He was down the science of mind. And I was like, woo woo, talking to fucking dead people. And I'm like, how do we like, how did, and then I learned that hypnosis allowed you to like heal your chakras and talk to past loved ones and develop your intuition. So we kind of merged has. And when we put those two together and kind of overlay like how your development at, in your mind and in the energetic body are correlated, it just showed me so much. Like when I was, in, you know, when I was developing my throat chakra as a little girl, I was abused and I, it led to years of tonsillitis, not speaking my truth, lying, being afraid to speak up, not setting boundaries. I had a major imbalance in the throat because of programmed shit that happened from childhood. So I feel like I want to share that, you know, if you have a physical disease or there is something that has this repeating block pattern, I encourage people to look through that system. Is it stuck in my root? Are my family relationships okay? And, you know, moving up to the heart, you talk about being open to give love, to surrender, to be at peace in those relationships. Uh, when we bring Chris in for the heart chakra meditation, we do hypnosis work on uh, a few of the, uh, like we kind of, we start the root, we hit the heart and then we hit the crown. We kind of just sandwich, you know, along the way with some hypnosis work. And I'll never forget one of the women that came we work through all, you know, the base the root and all the way up to solar plexus. And when we get to the heart, she's like, I'm fucking good. I'm great. I got this. I'm crushing it in business. Everything's great. I'm getting married. Love it. Blah, blah, blah. Like living her best life. We get to the heart. We do this inner child healing forgiveness work. And she comes up to me. I'm so fucked up. Oh my God. She's crying. And at the end of the retreat, she's very logical and not very feminine. So at the end of the retreat, she had on a pink sweatshirt and she came up and hugged me and hugged me for like a solid minute. And I stepped back and I was like, girl, we just opened your, your freaking heart chakra. She's like all thin. Now she's a mom. She's like had a baby. It's like the most beautiful thing to see what happens when you move through a system that is rooted in uh, stability. There's a foundation. It's like why I love reading tarot. The 78 cards represent 78 different aspects that your soul is going to experience in this incarnation. So there's no changing it as a set structure. And that's why I think the chakra system has resonated so much with me is because 
there's a set system that no matter where you're at on your journey, like we will find where your energy might be stuck or overbalanced or underbalanced. And it's just the most incredible tool that no one, it's a rainbow. I don't, it's just, I, I, like you said, I, we could talk about this for 10 years because it's just the most, there's so many nuances and so much depth that can go into our healing journey. And it doesn't have to be, you know, we're 12 years into this lifetime of conscious studying of like aware that we're d diving down this rabbit hole, but it doesn't have to be hard. It really can just be a willingness to change a willingness, you know, awareness is the key to change. So as long as we have just a little awareness around what do I want more of in my life or what do I want less of? I think that's the perfect start when it comes to our healing journey. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, is this prana edifying or prana depleting? Like a hundred percent. I love it. Yeah. I love how you're talking about the chakras as a map, right? Once we have a map, like the, the body, the energetic and physical body becomes so much easier to understand. And I think that's why the chakras are so popular. It's because that it's a map of both, right? Mm -hmm. Of both systems. Yeah. Love it. So good. Yeah. I, I want to switch gears just for a second, only because we've done so much, you know, yoga stuff, uh, led classes and stuff like that. When you are thinking through what you're going to do with a class, how mm. do you decide? Is it spontaneous? Do you have a system that you use? Is it a certain kind of a structure? Like how, how do you, even when you're coming with any kind of programming or anything like that, like how are you thinking about that before? Because obviously there's always going to be people of different skill levels. You're going to have to like sort of accommodate everybody. Like how do you think through that when you're in a group environment? Well, I'm a planner. <laughs> so what I like to do and what I teach my students to do in yoga teacher training is like I create a plan, but I'm also secure enough to throw out the plan. So I always say, you know, it's like classic. You have like this amazing twisty detox like theme sequence all about third chakra. And then it's like your class is like half pregnant women. And you're like, OK, we you know, we're not going to do that. That's that was the plan. But we're going to throw away the plan. So that's what I like to do. I like to be really intentional, have a very well thought out plan, meaning like the music, the cueing, like everything I've thought it out beforehand. I have it written down. But at the same time, I'm like completely willing to throw it away if you know, like half the people sitting in front of me are like, what's breath of fire, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> like yeah. we're, we're going to make an adjustment. So I think that's what's really worked well for me is like having a plan, but then being willing, being willing to be flexible because ultimately you need to serve the people in front of you. Yeah. The, the, that, what you just said is so important because it, it goes exactly back to what we said in the beginning. And that is so much of yoga is about building the discipline, but it's only about building the discipline so that you can let go of the discipline. Yes. It's like you, when you don't have it, you really need it. But then once you have it, you can kind of let it go. And, and to me, it's the same way with, with planning or with structure, with anything. You want to get rid of the anxiety that you would have if you're just like, well, I don't really know what we're going to do today. I've got all these people sitting in front of me. What the hell? You build the plan so that you don't have that like, well, well what am I going to do in the moment? Because once you get there, the answer will be there. But if you're anxious, it puts you in your head. And you can't kind of feel or hear exactly what's going on in the room. And so you get that disconnect. I, I love the discipline aspect. I'm glad we found Ashtanga early. And especially because we were, you know, already CrossFit goofballs, which means that like, I want to go in there and just how hardcore can we make it? How hard can this be for me? You know, just, just balls to the wall. Just how crazy can we go? And then once I got there, I did my first yin class after that. And I was like, oh, this is a whole island. I really like this. This is way harder, but I'm not moving. I've been sitting here for five minutes and this is 10 times harder. Like what the hell? And that's what I was saying earlier about the different aspects, because you can challenge yourself in so many different ways with yoga. There's so many different, different things you can discover, especially uh, too about your body. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of us besides using our body for things or going to the gym or running, we're so out of touch. We're so, I love that you said to put your hands on your body. Mm -hmm. How often do we put our hands on our body and touch ourselves? And I don't even mean in an intimate way, but, but that too. A lot, actually. But, but, you know, but, but, A but, lot of your Brit, but the average person. I'm trying to teach the people. But, but, but it's so true. It's like we rarely ask ourselves the questions and we rarely touch ourselves enough. And it, that's what gives us that disconnect. That's why we all of a sudden become perfectionists. We become people pleasers because we think that if we just do the right thing, if we just don't piss enough people off, people will love us. They'll give us, that, they'll, they'll give us that love that we internally need. But when you build it up yourself, when you're like, I'm just going to do this for me and see where it goes, you notice that you don't have to fill that cup. It's, it's already full. And if you add, if someone else adds some love in, well, that's really nice. I like that. That's really nice. But if they didn't, that would be okay too. It's so interesting how yoga can play so many different roles in our life and how it can teach us so many things. But it's like, a, it's like a self-teach. Like you have to figure it out. You know, like it, it will surface the answer up. You can be like, oh, you have to do the work to actually get there. It's, it's interesting because 
You can have teachers, you can have so many people help you, get you into positions, walk you through a class, but it's ultimately up to you as to where you take that energy, that that love that they're they're sending out on the mat. Yeah, this has been an epic conversation. Like I can't believe how much we've covered. Like we we really did. We went deep. We covered so much. Like you you guys are awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I feel like there's just infinite amount of things to talk about. So we'll have to do round two in the future. And I would love to um, just shine a light on where our audience can find more of this wisdom. Your YouTube channel is pop and sis, like love all the videos from Tantra to chakra challenge to just a basic morning routine practice. It's really incredible. The dynamic um, a variety that you've brought to the table when it comes to yoga. So where can our listeners find more of you and soak up your amazing wisdom? Well, thank you. That's so kind. And I, I received that. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. You can find me on YouTube, Brett Larkin Yoga, uh, B-R-E-T-T-L-A-R-K-I-N. That's also my website, brettlarkin.com. I have 200 hour yoga teacher training in both the Hatha Vinyasa style and the Kundalini style. Um, 300 hour teacher training. I have an embodied yoga life coaching certification now, which is like a somatic yoga and yeah, just tons of little courses. Like I have a course on the history of yoga. I also have the uplifted membership, which is basically like all the YouTube videos on steroids with like philosophy courses that go with them. So if you're a yoga nerd or you just want to really like go deep into yogic philosophy, I would love to connect with you. I want to thank you guys so much. I like I'm just blown away by your community and how you're integrating all these modalities. So just thank you so much for having me on and my book. Yeah. Yoga life. You can get it anywhere books are sold. So that means Amazon or bookshop.org. However you want to support um, books in this day and age, yoga life is available worldwide. Goddess Brett, you have been such a bright light here on the show. I would love to end by asking what we, we love hearing what an elevated life means to you. Mm-hmm. An elevated life means a heart-centered life. It means relinquishing control, living just fully from an embodied, heart-filled, responsive place. That's what it means to me. Mm, I love, mic drop. Yeah. So good and so true. So yoga life, elevated life, whatever your life is, like get it up there, like raise the vibration and live your best life because it is up to you. I think the takeaway for me from today was that you have the power to choose. You get to choose how you show up for your energy, how you take responsibility for it. And, you know, that to me reminds me of my favorite movie, which we just went to DC and got to see Dorothy's sparkly red shoes. Because in that movie, you know, it's a decision. When she made that decision is when everything changed. And I think today's conversation will hopefully inspire so many people to make that decision, to put themselves first, to commit to their practice of peace, whatever that looks like, whether it's breath work or walking or yoga or well, Tantra, you know, whatever you, whatever call it stirs you up and lights you. Uh, this is, you know, our invitation is that you find that thing that brings you home so that you can find inner peace. And until then, we'll catch you next time. Peace. <laughs>